You're listening to the Odds Cast, the original UFC betting podcast that's straight to the point. Hosted by leading MMA odds maker Nick Kalikas and MMA journalist Brian Hemminger, they provide you the absolute best UFC betting info, picks, statistics, and analysis from the most respected authority in mixed martial arts betting. MMAoddsbreaker.com. Don't place your wagers without us. Welcome to the Oddscast, presented by BetDSI. I'm Brian Hemminger, joined today by leading mixed martial arts odds maker Nick Kalikas to break down this Saturday's UFC on ESPN Plus 4 event, which takes place in Wichita, Kansas. If you're unfamiliar with our format, Nick and I will break down the fight card from top to bottom, providing extensive analysis and a pick for each fight after doing our film study for the event. Looking back at our last event, Kyle Marley won his one-unit free bet for UFC 235 on Johnny Walker at minus 128 odds. Marley has won about 200 units since last May, so definitely keep an eye on him. Uh, Marley has his bets and fantasy MMA picks available now on MMAOddsBreaker.com. Back to the present, UFC on ESPN Plus 4 features a 13-fight card in total and will be aired exclusively on ESPN Plus this Saturday night. Let's dive right in. Now, kicking things off on ESPN Plus is a lightweight contest between Alex White, who is 12-5, and five, and Dan Moret, who is 13-4. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Alex White opened minus 175, Dan Moret at plus 135, and that's based on our UFC Fight Night 146 opening betting odds reactions uh, posted by Adam Martin on our website. So this is, again, for UFC on ESPN Plus 4, a.k.a. UFC Fight Night 146. I know there's some confusion. That's why I'm kind of clearing that up for all those out there that are maybe kind of newer to the sport. Um, with that said, the current betting odds I'm going to quote are from betdsi.eu, so make sure you check out betdsi. And right now over at betdsi, we're seeing Alex White at minus 145. The comeback on Moret is at plus 115. Line margins have tightened up. A little bit more action at the sportsbooks coming in Moret's way. Not really that surprised. I mean, if you look at Alex White recently, he's been kind of a mess, man. I mean, he's lost, I believe, five out of his last seven fights. And that's saying a lot considering the guy at one point, I believe, was undefeated at 10-0. and So a lot of promise, a lot of hype, a lot of potential with Alex White. I mean, he has a pretty complete game overall. The guy doesn't have bad striking on the feet. He has some power. He's got some underrated wrestling to go along with some decent submissions as well. But the problem is, defensively, he's a little flawed on the feet. He gets tagged. You know, obviously, Jim Miller in his last fight just blew right through him. And, you know, obviously, we're talking about a decline to pass his prime Jim Miller that blew right through uh, White in his last fight. So that's not a good look for him at all. But that said, also, his kryptonite has been put, getting put on his back. So some of those the promising factors that I was just talking about have been his kryptonite as well. So, you know, there's some spots that you like in Alex White's game that you see some potential again. I mean, he does have that knockout power, and he does have the ability to win fights. It's just he hasn't put it all together enough to, you know, get on a roll here in the UFC. That said, Moret, a little bit more of a fresh person in the UFC. He's only had one true fight, and that was his UFC debut against uh, Gilbert Burns. But beyond that, I mean, he's a, a veteran of the sport. He's been around for a while competing against decent competition outside of the UFC before he made his UFC debut and has some solid wins on his resume. Another very complete fighter, trains at the MMA lab, a very solid game overall. Okay, striking. I mean, nothing that's going to blow you out of the water. Again, defensively, he, there is a concern with him as well. He has been knocked out a couple times, um, and I think out of the two, White probably does have the stand-up edge, and he is definitely the harder hitter here. So, I mean, if these guys are going to exchange, I trust White to land a little bit heavier here, and I think that he can win the stand-up battle. But Moret is going to be probably a little bit faster, and I think Moret is going to be dangerous as well, so White has to respect him on the feet. I think overall, Moret does go for takedowns, and he tries to utilize his ground game. I think that's his best attribute, and he's got some pretty slick submissions, and he's quick to pounce on something. So if you make a mistake and you give up your back, I mean, Moret's going to go after it, try to submit you and finish the fight as well. So he's a very capable grappler and again he's a pretty well-rounded fighter but when it's all said and done how they match up here I'm not sure if, if Moret's wrestling is going to be enough to get White down and, and to kind of utilize his strengths again White against White I think this is going to be a pretty competitive fight back and forth and I'm actually leaning towards White here I think he could do a little bit more damage on the feet again I think he's going to win the striking battle I think he could probably keep off his back enough to win this fight so not a, a very clear fight. I think it will be competitive. Um, I can understand why the dog action came in on Moret, but I think I'm going to go the other way and I'm going to pick White to win this fight. Yeah, this is a bit of a striker versus grappler matchup. Uh, White clearly wants to keep this fight standing, work his 
uh, boxing, kickboxing, whatever. Uh, Moret is definitely looking to, to get this fight to the floor. Um, the main thing here is while Moret is a decent ground fighter and has some takedowns, it feels like every time that he's really stepped up his game against somebody UFC caliber, he hasn't been able to get away with a win. Now, the White is not the best fighter on the planet, obviously. I mean, he's, what, uh, three and five, I think, in, in his UFC run so far. So, you know, he has not had the greatest UFC run, um, and especially has not had the most success since moving up to lightweight. He's gone one and three at that weight class. But uh, I'm still not a huge believer in Moret. He's not the most athletic guy. Um, he's not a very good striker on the feet. So he is absolutely going to need to take this fight to the floor to win. Um, and while White has had some issues with takedown defense, I'm just not quite sure I trust Dan Moret enough to consistently get this fight to the floor. And then once he gets to the floor, to be able to either keep White down or finish the fight on the ground. So I think uh, White can do enough damage on the feet. Uh, we saw Moret get, you know, steamrolled in uh, against Burns, but you know Burns at least had a huge ground game to fall back on that Moret had would have trouble taking the fight to the floor in the first place. So um, Burns was a lot more well rounded than White. And um, that being said, I, I just I think uh, White gets the job done here. I think uh, he he does enough damage on the feet to wear Moret down, and then. Uh, Moret is going to have uh, a little bit of too much trouble uh, consistently keeping White down. So I'm going to pick Alex White. I think uh, at some point he lands uh, enough strikes to, to finish this fight, uh, probably by TKO. Now, moving up to the welterweight division, we have Alex Morano, who is 15-5, and five, taking on Zach Otto, who is 17 and 17-6. Now, Nick, we're... What's the MMA odds makers perspective on this one? Murano open minus 190, the comeback on auto at plus 150. Right now over at Bet DSI, it's minus 180, plus 150. So line margins have tightened up. There is two way action coming out of this fight. Seems like auto is a little bit more of the popular player pick for this card. I don't know. I mean, I think this is a very close competitive fight as well. I think these guys are both on the same tier as far as quality, um, fighting goes. I mean, I don't know. I don't think one, I could see this fight basically going either way is what I'm trying to say here because I think Murano actually has a solid edge on the feet. I think he is the more dynamic fighter as far as landing that one pure knockout punch that can clearly put the lights out of Otto. Otto has been knocked out three times in his career, and, and Murano has those fists that are just underrated. I mean, he, you don't think he's got that kind of knockout power, and the guy lands and he just puts you out. So I think he does have the edge on the feet. I think Otto has the edge on the ground, and in the past, Murano has – had some issues with guys getting on top on the ground, out wrestling him, holding him down a little bit as well. Um, he does manage to get back up and his takedown defense is improving and he does have some submission skill on the ground. I mean, especially his guillotine choke, you definitely have to be um, worried about if you're going to take Murano to the ground. Um, that said, that's why I think it's going to be a close competitive fight because I think Otto does have a path to victory here. I think the striking is going to be close and competitive. Otto isn't exactly a terrible striker on the feet. Uh, he could put it together pretty well and, and make things interesting on the feet and, and probably um, push a little a bit of a pace on Murano at times. And like I said, make it interesting. But I think eventually the longer it stays on the feet, Murano is going to probably land that knockout blow and put Otto away. Um, so that's why I'm leaning a little bit more towards Murano here. I think that Otto is going to, utilize some of that wrestling if he has to, but he might not go to it enough early on. And I think that might cost him as well. So all depends on what kind of game plan Otto has here and how tough uh, and his shin's going to hold up here. But with all that said, I still don't trust him enough. I think there's more upside to Murano, even though he's had kind of a roller coaster ride in the UFC thus far, both these guys kind of have, and they've had their, you know, good moments in the sport as well. But I just think as far as they, this matchup goes, you got to be concerned at the betting window. You can't really trust either guy at this point, but I lean slightly a little bit more towards Murano for my personal opinion here. Yeah. This fight basically boils down to activity rate. You know, Murano's not the the most technical striker, but he pushes a high pace. Um, I mean, you look at uh, the statistics for this fight and, you know, Zach Otto just, does not really pull the trigger in his contest. He kind of sits back and lets the, the, the fight get dictated by his opponents. Typically, um, Murano outlands him almost two to one, uh, and also lands at a higher percentage rate. Um, so 
and has better defense. So, I mean, as long as this fight stays standing, Zach Otto is going to have a lot of trouble. He's going to have to probably land like a big knockout blow. He's got some power, so it could happen, but I just think it's unlikely. Um, I mean, if Otto is going to win this fight, it's either going to be with a, a random knockout out of nowhere, or he's going to have to land a takedown. Uh, Otto has decent takedown uh, offense, and Murano is not the greatest with takedown defense, so it could happen. But uh, Otto also has been keeping fights upright for the most part. I mean, his last fight, he took on a pure kickboxer um, as a huge underdog. And it was not the most competitive fight, but, I mean, he kept it upright for the most part and ended up winning a decision. So, or split decision. Uh, but I just don't think that's going to be the case here. Uh, his last opponent, Otto, uh, that Alexander dude just would not pull the trigger in his f- fight either. Like, it just looked like he was afraid to. So, uh, I don't think that'll be the case with Murano. Uh, Murano's going to be throwing leather for the entire duration of this fight. Uh, that's just the way this guy operates. I mean, he's aggressive and he throws in volume. And that's allowed him to, to defeat some people that he shouldn't have defeated, honestly. Uh, so I think, uh, in this fight, I mean, unless Otto can land that big shot or consistently get takedowns, then Murano is going to walk away with a one-sided decision. So Murano's going to be my pick. Now, dropping down to the Bantamweight division. We have Luis Smoka, who is 15 and 5, taking on Matt Schnell, who is 12 and 4. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Smoka opened minus 210, the comeback on Schnell at plus 160. Looking over at BetDSI right now, Smoka's minus 125, the comeback on Schnell is at minus 105. So line margins have tightened up a little bit, two action coming into this fight. But a lot more early action coming in on Schnell. And I'm saying two-way action because we're seeing some more action coming in Smoko's way right now as we speak. So this should be a good fight. I mean, this is definitely a fight for fans in a Bantamweight division that they probably are looking forward to. Because you got two high-quality, high-caliber fighters here that have fun games to watch overall. I mean, Smoka, every one of his fights in the UFC, even before he got, you know, cut from the roster or whatnot, you know, even in his losses, he's performed, man. I mean, the guy's an exciting fighter to watch for sure. He's a warrior. Um, You know, he could take some punishment, obviously on the feet. He could dish it out as well, but his attribute um, by far, his best attribute is obviously the ground game and some of the scrambles and some of the transitions that we've seen him, you know, in his past fights in the UFC, just a thing of beauty. So I think Smoka is definitely, you know, a welcome addition back to the UFC roster. And he proved that by, you know, coming back and, and getting another win and uh, kind of starting a, a new fresh win streak, I think, for him here and the UFC are at least capable of doing so with another win over a very game opponent, Schnell, um, at this card here. So I think with that said, Schnell is another very solid opponent that he's facing here. And I think he's a very capable fighter in his own right. I think he's got good striking. He's got good boxing. In fact, on the feet, I think Schnell's boxing is going to be a difficult thing for Smoko to take. I think Smoko is going to have to deal with a lot of pressure from uh, Schnell coming forward and, and utilizing some of that. And, and that's one thing that Smoko's had difficulties with in the past is some good boxers coming at him and just kind of getting through that defense and lighting him up a little bit. So, but one thing that you could, you know, definitely count on Smoko is he's game. He's not going to quit. He's going to absorb that punishment and keep fighting. So I don't think Schnell's going to be able to knock him out. But again, that is a concern if you're going to back Smoko in this fight. I think on the feed, he gets tagged up a little bit by Schnell. But that said, as far as chins go, I do trust Smoko's better. Like I just said, I think he can, he's more durable. He can absorb a better Schnell. It has been uh, a, a bit chinny in the past, uh, you know, and I know he's, you know, been in some firefights and his chin has survived pretty well at times, but still, I don't trust it as much in this spot here against Smoka. So with that said, uh, I think the ground edge actually goes to Smoka. I think he's wrestling has improved by leaps and bounds. It keeps on getting better. And I think it's going to be a real threat in this fight. Schnell in the past has had some problems outside of the UFC as well, getting put on his back. Now he's got a great grappling game, great transitions. He's got a dangerous guillotine choke. You have to be very cautious of taking Schnell down and putting him on his back. But that being said, a guy like Smolka, that's very good submission defense overall. And as, like I said, his transitional game on the ground is phenomenal. I think he's going to be fine kind of scrambling and battling and grappling with Schnell on the ground. So I think that's what's going to happen in this fight. I think 
the exchanges on the feet are, are going to be competitive at times, but Chanel should have the edge as far as boxing goes. But overall, the durability factor and the ground game of Smolka is going to come into play here, and he's going to get the W. So I do think that this is a good fight for Smolka to come back and win. Also, just a side note, if you look at the resumes, I mean, there's no comparison in my opinion. Smolka's fought by far the better fighters throughout their career. Chanel his last two fights in the UFC are his best wins, I think, of his whole career. So, I mean, you can't compare the resume. Smoke has been in tougher wars. He's been, you know, and I think through tougher competition. And I think that this is just going to be another quality win on his resume here. So the pick is Smoka. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets it done inside the distance. I'm not too concerned about this fight taking place at Bantamweight because both guys have historically fought at flyweight. Uh, they really, neither guy has a significant size advantage on the other. Um, Smolka, you know, he did not have the greatest run to end his initial UFC, uh, stretch, but he earned his way back and then he looked really good, uh, in his return. And, you know, this is a guy with a really nasty ground game. I mean, he has tenacious ground and pound, excellent submissions, um, and a decent, uh, ability to get the fight to the floor. Um, on the feet, he's always been a bit limited. Uh, but I mean, he has had his moments on the feet, uh, with his kicking game. But, uh, for the most part, I think Schnell will have the edge in that department, even though Schnell's chin has been shaky historically as well. Um, but my main thing here is, even though Schnell does have a little bit of a wrestling and takedown game, uh, I think at some point Smoka gets this fight to the floor. And then that's where he's going to be able to dictate everything. I mean, he is just that much better on the canvas than Schnell. So um, I'm going to go with uh, Louis Smoke. I think overall the ground game is just too far ahead and beyond of what Schnell has. And I don't think Schnell's advantages on the feet are enough to overcome that. So... Uh, I'm going to side with Luis Smoka. I think he gets this fight to the floor, and I think uh, he either TKOs or submits uh, Schnell within the, the first or second round. Now, moving up to the heavyweight division, we have Maurice Green, who is six and 6-2, taking on Jeff Hughes, who is 10-1. and one. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Hughes open minus 150. Maurice Green open plus 110, and right now looking over at Bet DSI, we are seeing Hughes at minus 215 to come back on Green at plus 175. So no surprise here. Hughes got bet up a little bit, as he should have. I mean, these guys had a fight not too long ago against each other, and Hughes came away with a title win, actually. It was a five-round um, fight, which was a, a pretty solid fight. I mean, I think it was a great fight for both men at that point of their careers, knocking on the door of the UFC, of course, at that time as well. And again, Jeff Hughes ended up uh, getting the decision win. And that was, I believe, at LFA 38 um, that he got um, a win over Maury Screen, again, by unanimous decision. So it wasn't too long ago. It was back in uh, April 2018. So now they're fighting again in the UFC. Of course, Maury Screen had some ultimate fighter experience um, since then and, you know, had a little bit of success. Um, and mixed results, obviously, you know, getting a loss on the show as well. But that said, I mean, this is a guy that has just a huge frame for the weight class, for the heavyweight weight class. I believe he stands six foot seven. And the guy's skill set is crazy because the guy has great striking uh, for a big man. I mean, he's got that unorthodox striking range. He's got good clinch work to go along with it. And if you put the guy on the ground, I mean, off his back for being more of a striker, the guy actually has some really good submissions. I think he's more of a threat in MMA on the ground than he is standing at times. So that's what you got to deal with with uh, Mo Green. He's definitely not an easy out wherever the fight takes place. I mean, there's a concern. He's a type of fighter that's a finisher, and you're in danger everywhere. But Hughes, on the other hand, is one of these guys that, again, has been around the game for a little while. He's an Ohio guy. He's, he's trains with uh, the champion, former champion, UFC champ, Stephen Mayosic. So he's getting some really solid training experience with high-level competition. He's got a good wrestling background. He's got good striking to go along with it. He was able to beat Green last time by mixing everything up, but just putting a complete game together and just out grinding and out working uh, Green to decision. Now, again, that was five rounds. This is three. I expect Hughes basically to do the same thing here. He knows what to look out for. He's got to have 
have some sense of confidence here. He knows it's not going to be an easy fight again, but he knows that he he was able to withstand everything that Green threw at him the first time. So I think he's going to have somewhat of a comfort level coming into this fight as, again. Now, again, he can't take this fight lightly. Of course, that's always a concern, but I think Hughes is going to do enough to get the job done once again. And that's why the early action is probably right in this fight. So can't count Green out. I mean, he's always a dangerous guy, especially, like I said, with the, just the size and the threat everywhere the fight takes place, but I still think that Hughes is the better overall fighter. He's going to mix in some takedowns, ring control, and again, and he's not going to be a fish out of water on the feet either, so the guy's just a very complete heavyweight, a good addition to the UFC roster, and I think he's going to keep his momentum going here with another win over Green. Yeah, and I completely agree here. Not enough time has really passed for either fighter to make significant progress to make me decide that this fight is going to be any different than the last one. I mean, the only difference that Nick pointed out is that this fight's going to be three rounds instead of five. So um, Maurice Green will have a little bit of a shorter time or to, to really push the pace. So if he's a little concerned about gas tank or anything, I guess he can just go for it a little bit more uh, with it being a three round fight compared to five. But Jeff Hughes still has the the same advantages that he had the last time. I think uh, he's just a little bit better on the feet, and he definitely is better on the ground with his wrestling. Um, so overall, I think that he's just going to get this fight to the floor and keep it there, and uh, and then outpoint Green when it is standing because Green's probably going to be worried about if and when Hughes takes this fight to the floor. Um, so, you know, Hughes being a talented fighter out of the strong style fight team, I, I thought he looked good in the Josh Appelt fight to, to earn his UFC debut here, uh, through uh, the, the contender series. And, um, and I thought he looked good the last time he faced Maurice Green. So, uh, this is definitely a winnable fight for Hughes and he should pull it out. Uh, I just don't think that Maurice Green's power and, athleticism are going to be enough to overcome the overall skill disadvantage and technical know-how that uh, Hughes should have over him. So my pick is going to be Jeff Hughes. Now dropping down to the featherweight division, we have Grant Dawson, who is 12 and one taking on Julian Erosa, who is 22 and six. Now, Nick, where did this fight open and how has the public shifted things so far? Dawson opened minus 185, Erosa plus 145, and right now looking over at Bet DSI, we are seeing Dawson at minus 175, the comeback plus 145, so line margins have tightened up. Two-way actually coming into this fight as well. Yeah, This is another interesting fight because you have Erosa, which is obviously the, the veteran of the sport that's been around for quite a while and has made some – you know, good waves from the Ultimate Fighter originally the first time out and then obviously getting dropped from the roster, which which was disappointing for him. But he made enough noise outside of the UFC and put together some impressive wins that the UFC actually brought him back. Now, they haven't done, done him any favors, really, how they matched him. I mean, you know, your return, here you go. Come back and fight Devontae Smith. Now, that was after, though, a very impressive win, we should say. We should give him credit for that Jamal Emmers win on the Contender Series. Um, so Erosa is one of these guys that, again, I, I have a ton of respect for the guy. I think he's a quality fighter. And again, another one of these guys that's game in all aspects of, of the game, really. I mean, in the stand up realm, I think he's pretty good, underrated. He's got a, a diverse striking attack where he can knock you out with his kicks. He could outbox you as well. I mean, so he mixes things up really well on the feet, has uh, underrated power to go along with it. Very smart, intelligent fighter, has good uh, ground game to go along with it as well. He's capable of winning by submission. He's got decent takedown defense. So he's a very complete fighter, but it's those fighters that are a level ahead of him in this particular area at times to get him. Like Devontae Smith, obviously, in his last fight, that you know he suffered a nasty loss to – I mean, Devontae Smith had a clear edge as far as striking goes, right, and knockout power, and he had obviously a take on defense to keep the fight upright. So with that said, he, he ends up getting beat. And, you know, that's been his kryptonite at times, where, where he's facing a guy that can put him on the ground and not grapple him or whatnot too. So Rosa's 
a very complete fighter that can is capable of beating most guys, in the, especially in the featherweight division. He's another guy that's bounced back between featherweight and lightweight. That should be stated as well. But here, they're not giving him another bone with the UFC in Dawson. I mean, Dawson's a, another guy that is a very highly touted prospect. I mean, he's young. He's 25 years old. Obviously, he's a uh, Dana White Contender Series winner as well. Um, he finished his fight on the Contender Series. Looked really good. I mean, the, the hype around Dawson, obviously, he trains with James James Krause and crew. Um, so good training camp. The guy, again, has been training for so long that he's one of these young guns that has a complete MMA game from the rip. I mean, he's a good fighter when it comes to standing up. That's probably not his best attribute, but he is aggressive on the feet. He does have knockout power. The guy throws nasty leg kicks. I mean, he just chops you down with these leg kicks, mixes everything up. Now, again, he gets a little sloppy at times because he throws so much power in what he throws. So defensively, that is a concern. He's got to tighten that defense up a little bit. Um, but other than that, he does have a great ground game. He goes for takedowns. He, he's got a solid wrestling foundation. And then once he gets on top, it's fun to watch this guy work. I mean, he just brutalizes his opponents at times with some nasty elbows, ground to pound. And then if he takes your back, he, he's capable of submitting you as well. So Dawson is a threat everywhere the t- fight takes place. So he could knock Arosa on the feet. He could take him down, probably avoid, obviously, his submissions and have his way with him on the ground as well. So again, stylistically, not an easy fight for Arosa. And again, the up-and-coming Dawson is kind of getting fed a guy that will make him look that much better if he gets a win over. I think this is kind of how the matchup goes here. So no favors for Arosa here. I think Arosa is going to be a very game fighter and difficult, especially for Dawson on the feet. If Dawson can't get the takedowns here, it's going to get really interesting. But that said, again, I think he is capable of landing a knockout blow along the way. So it's hard not to like Dawson in this fight. I mean, it's I think he has several ways to win this fight. He can win on the scorecards by just riding out top position at times on the ground. If he has to, he can knock Rosa out. Or again, again, I think you know he could possibly win this fight on the ground. So more ways to win for Dawson, which I do have a ton of respect for Rosa. So this would be a quality win for Dawson here. So the pick is Dawson to uh, get an impressive win and open up some eyes here. Yeah, I like Dawson here as well. Um, <clears throat> he is just overall a, a really talented up and coming fighter. I thought he looked great on the Tuesday night contender series opportunity that he had, um, where he picked up a second round submission over Adrian Diaz. Uh, the main issue with Dawson is he hasn't fought since uh, August of 2017, while Erosa has been, uh, more active. Uh, granted, you know, Rosa's activity rate includes, you know, getting completely steamrolled in his return to the UFC by Smith in 46 seconds. So, you know, even though Rosa's been more active, it hasn't exactly gone his way. Now, um, with Dawson, he is, in my opinion, just a really, really talented ground fighter. I mean, when this guy gets fights to the floor, he either finishes his opponent with a TKO on the canvas or he finishes them with a submission. Uh, on the feet, he's definitely a lot more vulnerable. Um, so Arosa will have the edge in the stand-up department. It's just what is, this fight's going to boil down to is how is Erosa's uh, takedown defense? I mean, for the most part, Erosa's takedown defense has been relatively good, but he hasn't faced a lot of guys that wanted to take the fight to the floor because Erosa's, you know, poor chin has... Uh, had guys just trying to take his head off the whole time. So now that he's actually facing a guy that is consistently going to be looking to take the fight to the canvas, I think uh, Erosa's statistics in that department might be a little bit skewed. Um, so overall, uh, Erosa will have the edge on the feet, but I do think Dawson does get this fight to the floor. He is a talented uh, takedown artist, and he has the wrestling to do it. Um, I think that he can overcome Erosa's uh, takedown defense. And Erosa is not terrible off of his back, but I think Dawson is just better from top position than Erosa is off of his back. I think he avoids any types of uh, crazy submission uh, that Erosa will be throwing his way. And I think at some point uh, Dawson puts Erosa on his back and probably TKOs him. I think that, that that'll be the, the best path to victory instead of looking for a submission because of Erosa's uh, durability issues. So my pick's going to be Graham Dawson. I think uh, he TKOs Erosa with ground and bound. Now, dropping down to the women's bantamweight division, we have Yana Kunitskaya, who is 11 and 11-4, taking on Marion Renault, who is 9-4-1. and one. Now, Nick... What's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? 
Kuniskaya open minus 150, the comeback on Renault at plus 110. Right now, looking over at BetDSI, we're seeing Kuniskaya minus 180, the comeback on Renault at plus 150. So, a little bit more action. It did come in Kuniskaya's way, and it continues to do so a little bit. And it seems like that is more of the popular pick here. But it's going to be a close fight. I'll tell you what, Renault is definitely the more, I think, sound, experienced, proven fighter at this point. But Kunitskaya is improving, and, and obviously there's a lot to like about her game, especially since she's been at the Jackson's camp. I mean, you can tell that she's getting, she's absorbing all the quality training and coaching she's getting over there, and she's putting it together. She's getting better. So she's closing some of the holes she's had in her game. But overall, she's an aggressive fighter. Uh, she's strong for the weight class for 135 pounds. If she's got some knockout power. Obviously, she likes to get the fight to the ground and work her ground game and, and just kind of ground around her way to uh, submissions as well. I mean, she's got a capability of uh, winning by submission. So she just basically controls you out, grinds you out, works you a little bit, and is just tough as nails and tough to get out of there. But at times, again, an area that she has addressed and is improving, she has – you know, had her flaws defensively and able to get submitted or whatnot and uh, kind of the spots that you don't want to see in fighters. Like she has to be a little bit smarter and a little bit uh, defensively concerned on the ground. And Renault especially in this matchup here, I mean, Renault is, again, a very solid fighter, very experienced fighter, fought the best of the best thus far in the in the UFC. Um, not that Kuniskaya hasn't fought a lot of good high caliber competition. Obviously, she's fought the likes of Cyborg. So, I mean, these ladies have both been in there with some high level competition, but as far as quality skill goes, I think Renault is actually the more technical fighter of the two. I think she is better on the feet with her boxing. I think she has a better ground game as far as pure submission skill goes overall, but I think what it comes down here in this spot is, is can Kuniskaya kind of get bully Renault enough to kind of grind out the win here and get it done? I think she probably can on the scorecards. I think defensively she's getting about as good as you could get at this point to probably fend off some of the takedowns or some, I should say, some of the submissions that are going to come from the takedowns that Kuniskaya coming is going to come for here in this spot. Because I, I see her kind of, again, getting Renault to the ground and avoiding some of those submission attempts and probably just kind of riding out a close, competitive, hard-fought battle in this fight. But again, Renault's very sneaky, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if she comes in here and pulls something off, even a fight that she's losing, and, and then just kind of finishes Kuniskaya. So that's the improvement I want to see and continue to hopefully Hopefully see from Kunitskaya, but overall I am going to side with her here. But as far as a bet goes, I wouldn't lay it, especially as it's climbing up to two to one. I don't think it's a smart move. I think it's kind of a dog or pass situation at this point because again, Renault is a little bit more technical sound. I think she's a little bit more capable of finishing the fight of the two. So that's where you got to be cautious here. So the pick is Kunitskaya. I think she can edge out a decision over Renault and it'll be a very quality win for her. No doubt about it, but I'm, I just don't trust her enough at the betting window to kind of lay that chalk. So be cautious in, in this one for sure. This fight will be competitive on the feet. Uh, Kunitskaya and Renault both are pretty talented strikers, although I think uh, I, I, I like uh, Renault's athleticism a little bit. She can really turn it on uh, against people where she starts to feel an advantage and she can press. Um, but Kunitskaya looked great in her debut at 135 after, uh, obviously, that ugly loss to Cyborg at 145. But at 135, Kunitskaya looks uh, dangerous, and she looked really good against Lena Landsberg at UFC 229. And I think that as long as she kind of follows that same game plan, she's going to be in good shape here as well because uh, Marion Renault, um, you know, she pushes a strong pace on the feet and she does have a pretty good ground game off of her back. But historically, her big issue has been uh, people taking her down and um, avoid when they avoid the submission after taking her down, then she gets in trouble. Uh, you saw that in Katzengano, who... Uh, took her down repeatedly and avoided the submissions and was able to win a decision against her. And I kind of see that same path to victory here for Kuniskaya because, I mean, she took Landsberg down repeatedly, avoided the submission, and won the decision. And uh, Kuniskaya is a you know, big, strong, has pretty good offensive wrestling. Renault's takedown defense is by far her biggest weakness. And... I think Kuniskaya is going to get this fight to the floor, and it's just going to matter of boiling down to whether or not Renault can catch her with an armbar or a triangle choke off of her back while Kuniskaya is taking her down. And as long as Kuniskaya can avoid those, then I think that she wins. So uh, I'm going to side with Kuniskaya to pull off the decision, and really the only thing that's 
scaring me whatsoever is the fact that Renault is definitely capable of getting a submission off of her back. Uh, but as long as Kuniskai can avoid that, then she should be in good shape. So Kuniskai is going to be my pick. Now, moving on to the welterweight division, we have Tony Martin, or Anthony Rocco Martin, who is 15-4, and four, taking on Sergio Moraes, who is 13-3-1. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Rocco Martin, open minus 210. The comeback of Moraes, plus 160. Right now, it's minus 210, plus 170. So, Lime Arch have tightened up a little bit to reaction coming to this fight. I think a lot of people are definitely, I think, not sure which way to go with this fight because Martin has been phenomenal recently and, and Moraes definitely gets some respect as well because he's a very solid fighter. Obviously, he's one of the better uh, ground practitioners in the sport period. I mean, the guy is phenomenal on the ground and ground whiz, but Moraes has also improved through the years. He's definitely improved his striking ability and he's got underrated punching power honestly to, to go along with it so he's no slouch anywhere the fight takes place um and if, especially if he gets you to the ground obviously it's it's probably over i mean right then and there even if you have a solid ground game like martin does i mean you're not going to compete with a guy like Maurice on the ground in most cases i mean look at what he did with ben saunders last time out i mean ben saunders has a phenomenal ground game never been subbed and um, Maurice goes out there and just makes it look easy. So that's how special this guy is on the ground. I think that's why it's tricky because whenever you have somebody of that caliber on the ground, you always got to be concerned. But you know what? It's hard not to pick against Rocco Martin at this point, man. I tell you what, he's been nothing but impressive. I mean, he's, you know, his health concerns or issues that he's straightened all the, the little flaws with his conditioning. Everything has been improved significantly in my opinion, you know, and, and he's talked about it and he's definitely on the right path and he's looked phenomenal. Like I said, he's on a nice three fight win streak. Um, and I guess solid competition. If you look at the likes of Ryan LaFleur, Jake Matthews, I mean, p- pulling off some great wins. And before that, you know, he's, he's just, to me, he's putting together everything mentally, physically. He's always had the skill as far as technique goes, because the guy, he could always get better as far as being a more devastating and more nasty striker, of course. But the guy has really good wrestling and he's got a good ground game to go along with it. So he's one of these fighters that's fun to watch in all aspects of the game. Now, of course, Against Moraes here, he has to be cautious because you don't want to wrestle. He does. He doesn't. He wants to use his wrestle, wrestling defensively. Obviously, to keep this fight upright and use a little bit of distance and control the striking aspect. Get behind that lead jab and try to pick Moraes apart on the feet. And I think he's capable of doing that. But that's again where it's tricky here because Moraes is going to be throwing some thunder as well. You know, if, if this fight doesn't take place on the ground, then I think Moraes is going to be the one that's a little bit less concerned about throwing harder punches at Martin. So Martin has to be cautious, but I think Martin's going to be able to pick Marais apart and with that accumulate enough strikes to put him ahead and either win on scorecards or maybe even finish Marais along the way. So I'm not going to go against Martin. I mean, I, like I said, to me, he's just looked very impressive mentally, physically. He's starting to figure things out and with that skill set that he has 170, 155. I mean, the move up to welterweight has looked great for him as well. So uh, I'm not doubting this guy right now. So he's looking good. Uh, he's going to keep that momentum riding, I think. And he's going to get a very solid win over a game race in this spot as well. Sergio Moraes is an elite ground fighter without an ability to get the fight to the ground, uh, but he's been able to make it work uh, with several wins inside the octagon because some guys are afraid of the ground and they've allowed him to dictate things on the feet um, or Moraes has landed, you know, a couple big bombs and actually picked up some wins on the feet throughout his run. Um, but I think against Tony Martin or Anthony Rocco Martin, as he likes to be called now, um, I think Martin is just going to be way too much for him here. Uh, Martin has looked tremendous since moving up to the welterweight division. I think not having to cut as much weight has really been a big boost for him. And considering that he was a big uh, lightweight, the the transition to welterweight has been very smooth. I mean, he's facing a guy in Sergio Moraes where Martin actually is the exact same height and actually has a, a bit of a reach advantage. So, I mean, he's he's now fighting guys more his size, but he's not cutting as much weight. And I think that that really was the biggest thing that was holding him back in the lightweight division, uh, where he had a lot of strong starts and fights. And early in his UFC run, he was, you know, gassing out and losing after the first round. Now, uh, against Moraes, uh, Martin's going to have a huge striking advantage. His jab is going to be killer. Uh, I think he'll mix things up really well. And as long... And Martin has a pretty good ground game as well. So 
Uh, he's had multiple, you know, impressive submission finishes, but that's not going to happen against Marais, um, because Marais is just a ridiculous ground fighter. So if this fight does go to the floor, I think Martin, at least his skill level is good enough to avoid getting submitted, but I just don't think that this fight goes to the floor because Martin is going to try to keep this upright and just outland Marais. Uh, Martin has some good power that has actually translated well at 170 pounds. Um, he can do some damage. And uh, I think as long as this fight stays standing, Martin's going to get the better of it consistently and uh, potentially can knock Marais out. But at worst, he outpoints Marais over the course of three rounds and at least wins a decision. So I'm going to side with uh, Anthony Rocco Martin. I think that he continues his run at 170 pounds. Now, moving on to the main card, we have a middleweight contest between Tim Boach, who is 21 and 12, and Omari Akhmedov, who is 17, 4 and 1. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? Akhmedov opened minus 230 to come back on Bosch at plus 170. And right now we're seeing Akhmedov at minus 140 to come back on Bosch at plus 110. So needless to say, all action coming in on Bosch. Not really that surprised. I mean, the way they match up here, it is definitely an intriguing fight. And I know Akhmedov isn't exactly a fan, a fan or better friendly fighter as, as far as the betting window goes. I mean, a lot of people aren't looking to go crazy out there and rush to bet, uh, on Akhmedov in fights, put it that way. That said, Bosch, in the past has made people a lot of money. So I think the MMA betting community as a whole respects Bosch a lot more than they do Akhmedov. And I think that's evident here as well, because that's the way the action is coming in. And, and despite Bosch being 38 years old um, and definitely a, a decline fighter, he's not at all close to what he was in his prime, a very durable, very hard nosed fighter. That's going to come at you and you know what you get. I mean, he's going to show up to fight each and every time out and a good takedown defense, typically in Bosch and just, just a solid, tough as nails guy that man he has enough power that if he hits you with a limb whether it's a kick knee elbow whatever i mean you feel it so he's not quite that bosch but he still has that old man strength kind of i don't want to call him an old man that's a bit disrespectful here because he's obviously he's out there competing at a high level still but you know what i'm talking about i mean he still has that strength and that power that's not going to go away and combine that with decent takedown defense i can understand why everybody's coming in a little bit more short uh on bosch here but Again, I don't think he is the fighter that he once was. I know, you know, obviously our, Antonio Carlos Jr. was able to dispose of him rather quickly in the first round um, of their fight. He didn't make it past round one. You know, obviously against a great ground guy like that. Now, Akhmedov isn't that level as of uh, Antonio Carlos Jr., but he does have a decent ground game in his own right. He does have some decent wrestling. He goes after those takedowns. He's capable of doing some good ground and pound um, and finishing fights that way as well. So, But even on the feet, he throws some bombs. He throws some haymakers. You can't take him lightly. And I think at this point of his career, Akhmedov, even if he's not the best striker of the two on the feet, and I think Bosch is, is going to be a bigger threat overall on the feet, obviously, Akhmedov can still land that one big bomb. So, I don't know. I'm just not sold on Bosch. I think Akhmedov probably is not getting the respect he deserves um, at this point. He does have some quality wins. You got to give him credit. I mean, he's put together, you know, some decent wins over No, uh, over Al Hassan, and it, what is a controversial close split decision type of fight, whatnot. Um, and then again, that Vittori fight in his last fight, Vittori, I think is probably a little bit better than uh, people give him credit for. And Akhmedov was able to to hang in there with a lot of decent fighters or a lot of tough competition and Bosch is just going to be another one of these guys. So what I'm trying to say is I think a lot of people were counting Akhmedov out a little bit too soon here. In my opinion, I think he can and is capable of winning this fight, even if it is a stylistically a tough matchup. So not confident though. I'm, I'm not going to go out there and tell you guys to bet Akhmedov or anything like that. But at this point, I'm probably going to go the other way and against all the betting action coming in with Bosch. And I'm going to side with Akhmedov. And I think Akhmedov surprisingly gets the, the W here again, not a very confident pick. This is definitely one I could see realistically going either way. So if you're betting this fight, approach it with caution. But again, I'll, I'll side with against the public and with um, Akhmedov here in this spot, because I do think he's being underrated just slightly in this spot. And I completely understand uh, the Akhmedov being underrated. I mean, the guy historically just goes out and gets takedowns and gets wins. Um, when he doesn't win, it's when he has issues with the takedown game. It's when he's slowed down and uh, when he's faced guys that had good uh, grappling backgrounds. And 
You know, Tim Boach does have a pretty good grappling background. He's a strong offensive wrestler. Um, now his takedown defense is not amazing. Uh, at 57%, it's, I think it could be good enough. Uh, you know, you look at the guys that have been able to put, uh, Boach on his back. Part of it was when he was fighting at, you know, light heavyweight. Uh, you know, guys like Phil Davis. Um, so I, I do feel like, uh, Boach is capable of, uh, stuffing takedowns from Akhmedov. And when he does, Boach is definitely going to have the edge on the feet. I mean, this guy is an absolute powerhouse. He has heavy hands. He has a good chin and, uh, and he can really lay into somebody like Akhmedov that does have some durability issues. So uh, I feel like Boach definitely will have the edge on the feet and Akhmedov is going to be looking for uh, takedowns repeatedly. And if Boach can stuff those takedowns, then he's going to be in really, really good shape. So, you know, this is an interesting fight. Uh, Boach has that, you know, a little bit of a judo and uh, wrestling base that he can fall back on. Um, you know, he hasn't looked the greatest at times, but I'm still a believer in Tim Boach, and I think that he does have some gas left in the tank. Um, it's just really going to boil down to, uh, you know, can he keep this fight upright? Because when he can't, I mean, that's when he looks bad. You know, when he faces the Jacques of the world who get the fight to the floor and submit him, or Antonio Carlos Jr., who is just a big, strong, physical, ground-fighting uh, Brazilian. Um, but when he keeps fights upright, you know, he's knocking out Johnny Hendricks or Rafael Natal or Josh Sam, Saman. So, uh, you know, this is a guy that is definitely capable of, uh, getting the job done. It's just, can he keep it upright? Um, that's really what it's going to boil down to. And I think that Boach can, but, uh, or at least I think he can, uh, get back to his feet. Uh, Akhmedov isn't nearly as dangerous when he does get the fight to the floor. I don't think Akhmedov's going to be TKOing Boach on the ground. I don't think Akhmedov's going to be submitting Boach on the ground if he does get the takedown. So I think Boach can fight his way back to the feet and start fighting back. So I'm side with Boach, but I'm not crazy confident about it. But I just think that Akhmedov's inability to get a finish when he gets fights to the floor is going to haunt him here. And I think he's going to spend a lot of energy trying to get this fight to the floor. And I think that it's going to tire him out. And I think that's really where Boach is going to start to take over. So I'm going to side with Tim Boach. Now, dropping down to the lightweight division, we have Benil Dariush, who is 15-4-1, taking on Drew Dober, who is 20-8 with one no contest. Now, Nick, where did this fight open and how has the public shifted things so far? Dariush open minus 185, the comeback on Dober plus 145. Right now looking over at Bet DSI, it's minus 195 for Dariush, the comeback on Dober plus 155. So line mergers have tied up a little bit, and there is two action coming to this fight. Not a tremendous amount of movement. And again, I think a lot of that's based on, I mean, what are you getting with Dariush lately? I mean, it's, it's just, you know, sad thing to say, but man, he's been a roller coaster ride. The guy has so much talent. I think he's one of the most talented lightweights in the roster, and he's been for a long time. Talk about complete skill sets. Man, this guy has it all. Striking, I mean, nasty striker at times on the feet. I mean, the guy can beat you with his boxing. He's got good kicks to go along with it. I mean, the type that can are capable of, of just devastating you on the feet. I mean, knocking you out with his kicks. I'm, I'm talking about knocking you out with his boxing. So knockout power in both hands and feet to go along with a dynamic wrestling game. I mean, he does have the capabilities of getting the fight to the ground and he's a grappler to go along with it. One of the best grapplers, you know, in the lightweight division as well. So very complete fighter. It's just the roller coaster run I'm talking about is he's chinny, obviously, and his conditioning at times lets him down as well. I mean, he has, I don't know. It's just inconsistent performances at times. And, you know, one time he, to me, he shows up and he looks like a future champion. And then in a couple fights later, he looks like he's just past it. So you just do not know what you're getting with him. Of course, he's coming off of a very solid win. He, he bounced back and a much needed win. I mean, he had three very bad performances, in my opinion, um, in a row. You know, the loss, obviously two devastating knockout losses in between a majority decision to Evan Dunham and that Dunham fight. I mean, even though Dunham's a very, 
solid veteran. I mean, he gets a ton of respect. I mean, come on. At this point, you should be able to, you know, Darius should be able to beat a guy like that. So it's just three terrible performances. But then he came back, you know, against a very game and up and coming prospect at Thiago Moses and, and puts together a quality win to get back on track. But what are we going to see next fight? I mean, so that's a concern here with Darius, in my opinion. And Dober, he has been a little bit more consistent. In fact, if anything, I think Dober's kind of, even though he's been around the sport for a long time, he's got a ton of experience. He's on the rise as far as UFC goes. I think he's actually never been better in his career. He's putting together some solid wins. Obviously, he's training at a great camp as well, and that's improved his game. He's got more mental confidence. I mean, he just his, he's defensively a little bit better as well. He's more confident. Every, just everything across the board. I mean, he's putting things together right. He's transitioning from his striking to his grappling well. He's got knockout power in the field. I mean, he's just he a lot of good things you want to see with Dober. He's improving. I mean, there's no question about it. So he's on the rise, and Darius is this guy that, to me, it looks like he's on a decline. So it's hard not to pick Dober in this fight. I don't think he's the better fighter. I think Darius could come in here, and if he fights smart, probably get Dober on his back and maybe, you know, look easy, uh, you know, in route to either a submission or a ground stoppage or possibly just grinding him out and winning on the card. So I could see that from Darius, but I just don't trust him enough. I think if Dober could keep this fight upright, on the feet and, and just start exchanging with Darius, I think he can knock him out, especially as the fight progresses. If, if Darius doesn't get rid of Dober in round one, if he doesn't hit him to the ground and take his back, I think he's going to have a problem in round two as as the fight progresses in round three possibly as well. So it's a dogger pass situation. I would not lay the chalk on Darius, even though I think he is very capable of going in there and just blowing Dober out of the water. I don't think you could risk it at this, you know, at this time in his career. So, you know, definitely caution when it comes to Darius at this, at this stage. So the pick is going to be Dober for me. Again, I'm going to throw out the little disclaimer that weigh ins at the times, you know, when a, when a back and forth fighter will not, uh, we have our stat picks that comes out on MMAOddsBreaker.com, and sometimes on a close fight that we might be on the fence about, uh, we will change our picks. So make sure you check out MMAOddsBreaker.com stat picks, and this could be one that I flip back to Darius because I do think he's a better. But, man, at this point, my head tells me to go with Dober, so I'm going to pick Dober to win. Yeah, and call me crazy, but I got to side with Drew Dober as well. The The main issue here for me is that Benil Dariush has been so inconsistent in his recent run. Uh, I know that he did pick up the win over Tiago Moises, but you know that's a guy that wanted to take the fight to the floor, which is Dariush's strongest uh, ability. And, uh, and Dariush was the better striker, and... Uh, Moises really just didn't have that easy path to victory. Uh, with, uh, Drew Dober, I think that he can, uh, potentially, uh, have a path to victory here. D- Dober's been on a nice run. He's improved his ground game. He's improved his wrestling. Um, the biggest disadvantage here, obviously, is, uh, Darius has that elite Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So if he does get this fight to the floor, I think Dober could be in some big trouble. Uh, and Darius is a good striker. I mean, he has power. He has good kicks. Um, he can definitely win, and he's got some uh, some heat in his hands. Uh, he can definitely win a stand-up fight, but uh, the main issue is uh, Darius's durability, his conditioning have been suspect in uh, recent fights. I mean, you saw it in uh, getting knocked out by Edson Barbosa. You saw it in the draw to Evan Dunham. You saw it when he got knocked out really quickly by Alexander Hernandez. Um, you know, those were all uh, fights where you know, he just did not look very good whatsoever. And granted, those were some very talented lightweights that he ran into. And I think all three of those guys are as good, if clearly, if not better than Drew Dober. But uh, just at the point in Darius's career, it feels like he's on the decline, even at 29 years old, which is crazy, but that's just what it feels like right now. And uh, uh, Drew Dober, I do feel like on the feet... Uh, even though Darius has some technical a- advantages on the feet, I think Dober's boxing and power uh, and his durability are much better. And I, he can push a pace that Darius uh, might not be able to keep up with. I think Darius will slow down in this fight. And uh, Dober, uh, as long as he can avoid being put on his back or being avo- can avoid a ground situation... I can see Dober wearing Darius down a little bit with the, you know, the high pace he pushes on the feet and, uh, landing that big shot and knocking Darius out. I mean, we've seen Darius lose 
uh, you know, he lost to Ramsey Nijam of all people back in the day, uh, because of chin issues and durability and, um, and getting a little tired. So if, uh, if Drew Dober can push that pace and force Darius into the defensive and avoid going to the ground, then I think Drew Dober actually has a realistic path to victory here. And I'm going to agree with Nick. I think Drew Dober actually does get the victory here. Maybe I'm overstating the decline of uh, Darius, but I just like where D- Dober's going at this point in his career, and I think uh, Darius is vulnerable right now. So I'm going to side with uh, Drew Dober. Now, moving up to the heavyweight division, we have Blagoy Ivanov, who is... 16 and 2 with one no contest taking on Ben Rothwell who is 36 and 10. Now Nick, what's the MMA odds makers perspective on this one? Ivanov open minus 130, Rothwell minus 110 and right now over at BetDSI you're seeing Ivanov minus 125 come back on Rothwell at minus 105. Interesting heavyweight clash. I mean, first things first, we got to point out that it's been about three years, almost three years since we've last seen Rothwell. Now he had a knee injury and after that he got busted by Usada. So he's been on the shelf. So we're going to see what it's like coming back from that long left for Rothwell. I mean, that is definitely a head scratcher for me, in my opinion, because Rothwell had some pretty decent momentum. You know, going his way, despite coming off the loss to JDS, of course, I know that, but I'm saying like, you know, he, Rothwell was definitely one of the better heavyweights on the roster at that time before that, coming off a very impressive win before that JDS loss to, um, from, you know, he beat Josh Barnett and he beat him by submission. And, uh, who does that to Josh Barnett? But anyway, that's the Rothwell that we're used to seeing and the respect that you got to give Rothwell because again, he's got heavy hands. He's a very complete fighter, been around for a long, long time in the heavyweight ranks. And I mean, you know, for, 37 with three years off. I mean, honestly, maybe it did him some good resting that body a little bit, healing up because he's been around the sport for so, so long. But that said, Rothwell is still one of the better heavyweights on the planet and you got to respect the guy. What, but I do think Ivanov is going to be a, a test for him here making his comeback return. I know a, another fighter that lost to JDS recently as well. I mean, and, and credit JDS because he fought a smart fight. I pointed Ivanov. Ivanov was not able to close that distance and he might have a similar problem with Rothwell. I mean, Rothwell obviously doesn't move as well and as smooth as JDS does on the feet. So I don't think it's going to be as much of a problem for Ivanov to close that distance and try to land those strikes on Rothwell. But that said, still, he's going to be the shorter fighter. He's going to have a five rich, five inch um, reach discrepancy, pure reach, that is. Um, and, and that should be a problem a little bit because Rothwell can utilize some of that length, of course. Now, as far as the ground game goes, both these guys are, are definitely capable of, of finishing their opponents on the ground. Both of them have a ton of subs. I mean, Ivanov has six, but that's out of his 16 wins or so. And I believe Rothwell submitted like 13 fighters. So both these guys are capable of landing, especially those chokes, man. The front chokes are, are just nasty from these guys. So very slick submissions for heavyweights that you wouldn't really expect um, to just kind of throw at you. And, and again, both warriors both can absorb some punishment and dish it out as well. So I think this is going to be a very good fight. Um, I'm going to lean again, go outside of everybody's common pick here. And I think a lot of people are thinking that Rothwell is going to come back and just automatically run through Ivanov, especially after seeing the problems that he had against JDS. I think this is going to be a different fight for him. And I think he can have a little bit more success everywhere. This fight takes place for Ivanov. And again, obviously most of it should take place on the feet here because I think they probably neutralize each other out as far as the wrestling goes. So with that said, I think Ivanov, again, closes that distance and putting together some combos that uh, bother Rothwell along the way and maybe lands enough to to get Rothwell out of there along the way as well. So I think this is going to be a great heavyweight battle, and I'm going to go against the grain and pick Ivanov to win this fight. So it should be fireworks, and I'm expecting it to be, and I hope it does live up to my expectations at least. Yeah, it's kind of crazy that uh, both of these guys' last fights were five round beatdowns at the hand of Junior Dos Santos. Uh, but, uh, Ben Rothwell, he took his beating with grace and then, uh, went and tested positive for some, uh, banned substances and took a two year suspension. Uh, Ivanov, I mean, that was his UFC debut in the main event, a lot of pressure, but I mean, he just got the, the crap kicked out of him in that fight. So, uh, now these guys are actually fighting each other. The, the, the main thing that's the difference other than the reach that Nick mentioned is the fact that 
Rothwell hasn't fought in about almost three years. Um, you know, he's been suspended before. He's come back from long layoffs before, and he looks fine. So I don't think it'll be that big of a difference. Uh, age, same thing. Uh, at heavyweight, you know, people in at 37 years old or whatever, it's not that big of a deal. So I, I think uh, the age won't be that much of a factor either. Um, so what this fight's going to boil down to is uh, pace and technique and durability. And uh, Ben Rothwell is one of the toughest heavyweights there is, so I don't think durability will be an issue. Uh, Rothwell does push a little bit higher of a pace. Now, uh, Ivanov might be a little more prone to uh, pushing the tempo a little bit this time, considering that Rothwell doesn't have the the technical precision and everything that Junior Dos Santos possesses. So maybe he was a little bit afraid to pull the trigger uh, against Dos Santos and, and he'll turn it up a notch against Rothwell. Uh, but you look at uh, Ivanov's career and, and he's had some quality wins. You know, he's picked up a few victories over some guys that were UFC caliber, but uh, when he's faced guys that were legit, you know, top 10 UFC heavyweights, I mean, he's been smoked. Uh, by Volkov and by Dos Santos. Now, uh, Rothwell is capable of being a top 10 heavyweight. So, um, I mean, he was in that vicinity, uh, at the time of, uh, his last loss to Dos Santos. And if he's still at that level, I think that he's going to present some problems here for Ivanov. I don't think Ivanov can get this fight to the floor and on the feet. I just think, uh, Rothwell will push the high enough pace with, uh, a lot of power behind his shots. And I just don't think Ivanov will be able to keep keep up with him. So uh, I've been tricked in the past. So uh, Ivanov has uh, surprised me. I mean, the the stuff that he's gone through throughout his life is just mind blowing. Um, so uh, I I can't completely discount him here. But I think uh, as long as Ben Rothwell returns to form, at least. 75, 80% of what he was before his last uh, UFC fight, then I think that he's got a pretty good shot of uh, picking up the victory here. So I think uh, Rothwell outpaces Ivanov and gets the win. Now, dropping down to the welterweight division, we have Tim Means, who is 28, 10, and 1 with one no contest, taking on Nico Price, who is 12 and 2 with one no contest. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Nico Price opened minus 125. The comeback on Means at minus 115. Right now over Bet DSI, we're seeing the line at minus 205 for Means. The comeback plus 165 for Price. So line flipped. Means a two, two to one favorite right now. Rightfully so, honestly, as far as Means being the rightful favorite. I think, I mean, from what he's accomplished and what he's been through through his career, it's hard not to, to favor Means in this fight. There's a lot of similarities between the two. I think they're both the nasty finishers that are capable of, of going out there and just destroying people at, at times. I mean, when they're on, they're on. It's 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 pretty fun to watch these guys compete as well. So a lot of similarities in that nastiness aspect of it. But overall, Means is, is the more complete fighter, in my opinion, and he's been the more battle-tested fighter. And I trust him a little bit more at this point. But that said, out of the two, I think that there's more upside right now in Price because I think he still has – a lot more room for growth, whereas Means, I honestly think he's on a bit of a decline. I mean, he's obviously still capable of winning a lot of fights in the welterweight division, and he's going to do so, but I still think that he's definitely not peaking right now. He's taking a few steps back. His fights are getting a little bit more competitive. He's not finishing as much as he he can or he has in the past as well. Now, of course, uh, competition levels drastically changed and it's getting you know a cr to a crazy level with means because he get nothing but hard fights and he's coming off i'm saying all this and he's coming off of a finish again um in his last fight over a very game ricky rainey so that said i still think overall though i don't see means on the rise i, I do think that he's kind of going to be gradually declining as his career progresses from this point and i think price again has that upside and that room to improve and get better fight by fight so that's what makes this fight a little bit tricky for me. I, I could see these guys both going out there and just being capable of, of putting it on each other and, and um, of causing some issues back and forth. I mean, both these guys are vulnerable at times of getting put on their back. Both these guys um, have a bit 
bit of a ground game, and if they get on top, they could definitely do some damage as well. So it all depends on who gets positioning in this fight, and and who's a little bit more durable. With so with all that said, I think I still do trust Means. I think he is a little bit more durable in my eyes, and he's a little bit more defensively sound of the two. So even though Price is more of the wild man, in my opinion, more of the wild gun, and you don't know what he's going to go out there and and do at times. I, I, he's a little bit more unpredictable. I still think that Means gets the job done here, and I, I just trust him and depend on him a little bit more in this case. So my pick is means and now where the price is now at two to one, I think the value is obviously gone. Those of you guys that came in and chewed up all that, uh, you know, light chalk early on, I think that was the way to go. And where it is right now, it's a little bit tougher to bet at two to one. So approach it with caution where it is right now. But early on, those of you guys that got the early numbers, hats off to you. Yeah, this fight's interesting to me because, you know, Nico Price has had his moments in the UFC and uh, Tim Means, I mean, he's been around forever. This is, I think, his 18th fight inside the octagon. Uh, Price is coming off of a horrific fight where he just got crushed by Abdul Razak Al-Hassan in, in 43 seconds. Means, on the other hand, is actually coming off of a win where he won in a, a minute 18. But before that, he lost a back-to-back split decisions against guys that uh, maybe against below Muhammad I can understand because of the pace Muhammad pushes but he should not have lost to Sergio Moraes. If he doesn't get submitted by Moraes, he should not be losing, especially in a fight that's primarily taking place on the, on the feet. So uh, that was really disappointing. And I'm hoping that he bounced back, that he got his confidence back with the Ricky Rainey fight. But if uh, if the Tim Means show, that fought Sergio Moraes shows up uh, against Nico Price, he's probably going to be in trouble because Nico Price is a guy that uh, is aggressive and has power and uh, looks for the finish consistently. Um, So um, means could be outworked and could potentially lose a decision if he, if that version of him shows up, but if the aggressive Tim Means shows up uh, the one that, you know, has a lot more confidence in himself, the guy that went on a four fight win streak, uh, won six out of seven fights at one point in uh, his UFC run shows up then I think that he'll be in good shape. I mean, Means has uh, good power. He has uh, a good pace. He has he, he does a lot of things right, um, but he also has had some issues with guys that can potentially get fights to the floor or uh, sometimes he just gets outworked on the feet by uh, uh, a good technician or somebody that throws at a high volume. So I'm a little concerned about that against Price, but I also have a lot more confidence in Means' durability um, and the fact that, you know, he has been in the UFC for so long. He's seen a lot of things. And I don't think Nico Price brings anything to the table that Tim Means hasn't seen before, um, except for the fact that, you know, Price really isn't going to have a huge threat of taking this fight to the floor. So I think Means will have a lot more confidence uh, throwing down with Price on the feet and, uh, potentially means might even look to take this fight to the floor. I mean, he's not traditionally been a big, uh, takedown guy, but I actually think that he has the, the better ground game of the two. So, uh, I, I think Tim means just has a, a few more ways to win and I trust his chin and his power. And as long as he trusts it, then he should be in relatively good shape here against Nico price. I think that he could win, uh, by knockout. He could win by submission, could win by a uh, decision. So I like the path to victory for Tim Means, and I think uh, he does get the victory here on Saturday night. Now, moving on and sticking with the welterweight division for the co-main event of the evening, we have Elizu Zaleski dos Santos, who is 20 and 5, taking on Curtis Millinder, who is 17 and 3. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Millinder up at minus 125, Zaleski de Santos at minus 115 right now. What you're seeing over at BetDSI is Millinder minus 130, even money. So Limars have tightened up. There is two action in this fight. It's been bouncing around a little bit, but more support coming in Millinder's way, and it seems to be the popular side overall. I mean, again, another spot. How could you argue which, what you've seen thus far from Millinder in his UFC career? It's only been a few fights. I mean, but in those three fights that he's had, holy cow. I mean, the guy has definitely faced good competition, and he's performed really well to say the least. So another one of these guys that's kind of coming into his own, I think he's 
the best he's been. He's been outside of the UFC. He has faced some really solid competition in decent organizations as well with the likes of LFA with Bellator. So Millinder was brought up against decent competition and brought up the proper way where now I think he's definitely finding his groove in the UFC with those, like I said, with those wins that he's catching and mentally, physically, everything's coming together for him. And this is the best Millinder I've seen. I've been watching this guy fight for a long time. And I mean, this is the best version by far that I've seen. His striking is on point. His takedown defense has never been better. Um, his conditioning, everything. I mean, he's fighting smarter. He's listening to his coaches. There's a lot to like about Millinder. So again, with people coming in, it's seeing all that quality uh, surrounding Millinder and how well he's performed. I don't, I'm not surprised at all that they're, you know, coming in that way. But that said, man, I think people are counting as a Lusky Dos Santos a, a lot of ways as well. I mean, I know it's been a little bit longer since we've last seen him compete. But let's not forget what this guy's capable of. I mean, he's put together some impressive wins in his own right. I mean, you know, getting rid of Sean Strickland like he did not too long ago. Uh, I mean, that was really impressive. Uh, Griffin, Max Griffin, we've seen him competing at a high level. Uh, Lyman Good, I mean, just Akhmedov getting rid of him like he did early on. And uh, I believe it was um, his second UFC fight or so. But so – that said, you've seen the progression and, and the improvements of Zaleski's game. And I mean, some of the striking that we've seen him put on his opponents has been a thing of beauty as well. And then all to go along with it, though, he does have a capable ground game. He's capable of getting uh, some takedowns. He's capable of reversing things if he is put on his back. So he is a very complete fighter as well. It's just his punching power and his accuracy and his striking, what he throws, his unorthodox striking ability. It's just, uh, like I said, it's fun to watch him strike. So I think this is going to be a fun fight in all aspects of the game. These are two of the better welterweights right now on the roster. They're kind of ascending towards the top of the division. So I, I love this matchup. I'm, I'm glad they made it, and it's fitting to be a co-main event as well. I think it de- deserves to be up towards the top of this card. So really looking forward to it. But again, I'm going to kind of go inside with Zaleski Dos Santos in this spot. I've been a little bit more impressed with him overall, and I think he is the better fighter of the two as far as complete game goes. I know, again, I've said a lot of good stuff about Millinder, but I, I still do think there's a, a little bit to be desired on the ground from him. He can get controlled. He can get put on his back and he can uh, get beat on the ground a little bit from better ground fighters. And I think Dos Santos does have the ground edge on as far as this fight goes and this matchup goes. Now that said, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe Millender gets top position at a time or two along the way, because I think Millender is going to want to try to explore that option because both these guys are extremely dangerous, as I said, on the feet. So both of them, I think will attempt to get a takedown or two along the way, but I still think Dos Santos wins the overall, overall ground battle. I I think he's capable of maybe even finishing Millinder on the ground, but if not, I think on the feet, he's going to have enough success to probably steal a decision or never know. Like I said, these guys are capable of knocking each other out. Maybe Dos Santos does catch Millinder, knock him out on the feet as well. So there's just more ways to win for me, and, and I do think Zaleski Dos Santos is the better fighter. So this is a dog or pass situation for me, and I think I'm going to pick dog here and Zaleski Dos Santos to get the win, a quality win over a very game, Curtis Millinder. This is a terrific matchup, and, and Curtis Millinder has really impressed so far in his brief UFC run. Uh, obviously, that huge win in his debut over Tiago Alves was crazy impressive, getting a, a stoppage victory over a former title challenger, and he hasn't really slowed down yet. I mean, granted, he hasn't got a stoppage victory since then, but he's still been picking up some uh, decision wins over some uh, tough opposition, but... Uh, the thing that I really like about Elizu, uh, Zaleski Dos Santo is the well-roundedness of his game. Now, clearly more recently, he's been obliterating people with some spinning attacks and flying knees, but, uh, this is a guy with, uh, an excellent ground game to back up his offensive striking ability. Uh, and he's on a huge role right now in the welterweight division. Uh, Zaleski Dos Santos, now, this is a guy that you cannot sleep on right now. He has uh knockout power on the feet. He has submission ability on the ground. He has a little bit of wrestling to get the fight to the floor if he wants to. Um, and uh, I do think uh, on the feet he pushes a really high pace and um, has some excellent striking defense. I mean, this is a guy that I think is going to hold his own with Mill in the feet and that's not an easy task because Millinder is, you know, at six foot two in the welterweight division with a 76 inch reach. You know, he's a guy that, uh, is going to pose a lot of problems to a lot of people. And, uh, 
his size is so far been very frustrating for people to, to, to try to figure out. But I think, uh, Zaleski is going to be capable here. I mean, he's only giving up three inches in reach. Um, he's only a inch or two shorter. So I think, uh, Zaleski actually is just as good of a striker, if not better. I think his durability is excellent. So I'm not too worried about him eating a shot coming in, uh, trying to get inside the range of Millinder and, uh, Millinder's takedown defense so far has only been 57% and he hasn't faced somebody even close to the ground level of Eliza Zaleski. So I think, uh, you know, Zaleski's going to hold his own on the feet, if not potentially get the better of Millinder because of, uh, just some of the crazy things he can do here with some spinning attacks, jumping attacks, some explosive attacks that he can, uh, bring to the table. But I think uh, Zaleski also can get this fight to the floor, and that really is the biggest weakness. Uh, Millinder is not very good on the ground. Um, I mean, he's okay when he's in top position, but uh, if he gets put on his back, he's he's really going to struggle here. And I think that's really where uh, the biggest advantage for uh, Dos Santos is. So uh, I'm going to side with uh, Eliza Zaleski Dos Santos. Uh, Millinder is long and difficult to deal with, but I think... Uh, Eliza Zaleski dos Santos has the striking ability to hang with him on the feet and then has the edge on the ground as well, a big edge. So I think at some point, uh, the fight does go to the floor and we're really going to see the difference in ground skills here. And, uh, Millinder might get exposed a little bit. So I'm going to side with Eliza Zaleski dos Santos. I think he gets the victory. Now this brings us to the main event of the evening in the heavyweight division. We have Derek Lewis, who is 21 and 6 with one no contest, taking on former champion Junior Dos Santos, who is 20 and 5. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Junior Dos Santos, JDS open minus 145. Come back on Derek Lewis at plus 105. Right now, looking over at Bet DSI, you're seeing Junior Dos Santos at minus 205. The come back on Lewis at plus 165. So more action coming in JDS's way, of course, not a, not a big surprise in that aspect of things. Uh, there's no question who the better fighter is. I mean, Junior Dos Santos is by far the better fighter here in all aspects of the game. Again, Derek Lewis is just a powerful guy that's durable, that's tough, that if he, man, he gets on top of you in a fight, you're on your back, you're in some serious trouble because this guy drops absolute bombs. Um, and also, if you're in trouble – in a fight if you don't take him serious. And even in the third round, you could ask Volkov. I mean, he was minutes or seconds, I should say, away from winning that fight. And bam, one shot gets through from Lewis and it changes the whole complexion of the fight. So that's the kind of knockout power Lewis has. Now, he doesn't always let his hands go and, and just release that nasty knockout power, you know, and, and against JDS, he's going to have to kind of do that. If I think if for his chance to win, he's going to have to let those um, hands go. He's going to have to take some risks. He's going to have to try to close that distance because JDS is the superior striker by far. He's going to be able to utilize that striking advantage. He, he, JDS has the ground game here as well. I mean, he's, he's got an advantage everywhere that the fight takes place. He doesn't utilize that wrestling a lot of times, but if he has to, he can do so. And if he has to shoot for a takedown, get on top of Lewis and, and drop some bombs, I wouldn't be surprised if he does that. Not that that's going to be his path to victory, but this is a five round fight. And at times, man, you have to adapt and go with the flow. If he sees, if he sees himself in danger, wouldn't be surprised if he does kind of change course and go that route. But the danger there is if Lewis reverses position, he's a hard guy to keep down and gets on top, then you're in some serious trouble. Like I said, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this fight. I mean, I think this has potential to, to kind of be one of those boring fights that, that these guys kind of sit there and look at each other a little while. JDS kind of circling around, waiting, picking Lewis apart a little bit, but kind of respecting Lewis's power. And Lewis just kind of sitting back and trying to figure out a way to get inside. So this could be a very dull, boring, heavyweight fight. Um, and all of a sudden, bam, one shot, one of these guys explodes and it's it's over. I mean, it could be that fast as well. So hopefully I'm wrong and it, it, it is an exciting war. I mean, that's what we all want to see, but I don't know. I mean, for a main event, I, I think that we're going to probably be disappointed however this thing plays out. I mean, again, much respect to both fighters that deserve to be in the top 10 and getting a shot in the UFC heavyweight division towards the top as they are. But I think matchmaking wise, if Lewis doesn't let those hands go, this can potentially be a very long, boring fight. So 
I'm going to pick JDS, and I mean, there's not much to be said about this. I mean, Lewis has a puncher's chance, and he's dangerous as far as the betting window goes. I wouldn't lay it over JDS. I mean, the guy's 35 years old. He's been knocked out. He's been in those wars. I know he's, again, he's looked better as of late. He's faced some dangerous opponents and, and Tui Vasa and Ivanov, and he survived those guys, but still. I don't trust it. He's 35 years old. He's past his prime for sure. I don't trust his durability as much anymore, even though he is the better fighter by far here. Stay away from this fight if you're going to lay the chalk on JDS. I think the, the props are probably their way to go um, when it comes to this fight. So check out some prop options and you get a better price. If you like Lewis, go Lewis by knockout. If you like JDS, um, there's some intriguing decision props or something of that nature or, you know, maybe inside the distance type of props that you could get a better price than laying that two to one chalk on JDS. So with that said, the pick is JDS. I kind of hope he doesn't lose to a fighter like Lewis because it would be a shame as far as his legacy goes. I think he's just that much better. So the pick is JDS. Let's see gets it done. I mean, this is the story of just about any Derek Lewis fight is, you know, on the feet, he's got power, but he has very little technique. He has very little pace. Um, Realistically, the only way he's going to defeat Junior Dos Santos is either if Dos Santos slips and falls and Lewis gets on top of him and drops those insane ground and pound skills that he has, or if he lands a haymaker. I mean, we've seen it time and time again, guys that have really good technical striking skills, they tear Derek Lewis apart. Um, you know, Volkov was obliterating Lewis for two rounds and about 45 seconds. And then Lewis landed a haymaker in the last 15 seconds as Volkov was trying to back away from him and knocked him out and ended up winning the fight. Uh, we saw uh, Mark Hunt just tear Lewis into one uh, on the feet. Um, and I think Junior Dos Santos is just as good of a striker, if not better, than both of those guys. So uh, Dos Santos has just really crisp, clean technical boxing. And he's going to be outwinning uh, Derek Lewis. He's faster. He's the better athlete. Uh, Lewis just, you know, he's got that quick explosion and the huge, ridiculous knockout power. But other than that, there's really nothing he can offer Junior Dos Santos here. So unless Lewis lands that big, crazy shot, then uh, I think Junior Dos Santos just pieces him up, uh, carves him up like a Thanksgiving turkey uh, over the course of five rounds. And I think at some point, uh, some, some body shots from Dos Santos that are gonna fold Lewis in half, and Dos Santos will pour it on and put him away. Um, uh, just, he has to be careful because, you know, when Lewis is backed into a corner, he can wing a big crazy shot and it could catch Dos Santos out of nowhere. But other than that, actually landing, uh, I think this is by far, uh, Junior Dos Santos' fight to lose. Um, he should, uh, not just win, but win impressively. Like Lewis, you know, he's, he's gotten away with so many times, uh, his power overcoming the technical disadvantages that he has in fights. And, uh, he's going to have to do that again this time, but I just don't think he does. So I think Junior Dos Santos either wins a decision or wins by TKO. Uh, and, uh, Derek Lewis really just has that puncher's chance. So that'll do it for our full event breakdown for UFC on ESPN Plus 4. If we have a free play to give out, make sure to follow at MMAOB Premium on Twitter because that's where we'll post it first. We can also notify you of our free bets via email alert if you prefer that method. Just send an email to picks at MMAOddsBreaker.com and we'll add you to our free bet mailing list. Special thanks to BetDSI. Good luck, everyone, and hopefully the betting gods are on your side this weekend. 